Despite the success of antiretroviral therapy, viral rebound is inevitable in almost all individuals when treatment is interrupted. The main obstacle to HIV cure is the persistence of HIV despite antiretroviral therapy and plasma viral suppression to undetectable levels on commercial assays. This talk will involve quite a lot of um, basic science and I hope that you'll stick with me because I think that understanding the mechanism of HIV persistence is essential for the development of strategies to induce HIV remission. So, um, in the presentation, uh, I will cover um, the detection and quantification of HIV persistence, establishment of HIV persistence, the effect of art on HIV persistence, and mechanisms of viral persistence on art. So, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but I will just um, give you a quick reminder so that uh, we can um, interpret um, the ongoing data uh, more easily. So here you can see is HIV life cycle. HIV binds to CD4 and um, the co-receptors and gain entry into the cell. After HIV gains cellular entry, HIV RNA is first transcribed into viral DNA. Viral DNA then enters the nucleus and is integrated into the host DNA. Normally, uh, when there is productive infection, the provirus will be transcribed using host machinery to a viral RNA leading to viral protein production and virion formation. In rare instances, latency occurs, and this is characterized by a provirus that is by definition transcriptionally silent. So this is one of the recurring concepts that I will bring back um, throughout the talk, and that it's HIV persistent on art is due to the existence of Firstly, the latent viral reservoir, and as I mentioned, the reservoir is made up of infected cells that harbor HIV DNA, that during latency, these cells are transcriptionally silent, so they do not make viral RNA or viral proteins, but they later can become activated and produce infectious HIV virions. Secondly, um, there is also ongoing transcription and virus production. And I'm quite careful to not use the word um, new rounds of infection um, in this context. So this figure illustrates the different so, uh, sources of HIV persistence. So up here, you can see the cell, um, the viral DNA or the provirus is in red. It's integrated into the host DNA. and um, this is what we typically think of a latently infected cell in that it, it does not produce any viral RNA or viral protein. Um, next, you can see this cell is uh, transcribing. Um, so there's viral mRNA being produced. Um, the production of mRNA does not necessarily imply a productive infection. Uh, then you can see this cell is producing viral protein as well. And then finally, this cell is producing um, virions. And under the um, influence of ART with um, a suppression, an infection of another cell is unlikely to occur. So after these broad concepts, I'll go into more detail, firstly, on detecting and quantifying HIV persistence. So um, there are many methods to quantify the HIV reservoir. I'll just highlight um, the most commonly used methods that uh, we tend to see in the literature. So firstly, um, the viral outgrowth assay. So the viral outgrowth assay is um, thought of as the gold standard um, to quantify the latent HIV reservoir. So in this assay, resting CD4 T cells are isolated from PBMC. They're plated in limiting dilution or at different concentrations. And then um, they're activated to induce viral transcription and virus production. Donor CD4 lymphoblasts are then added. A 
at different time points to propagate the infection. The levels of activated virus released is measured by P24 assay by ELISA traditionally. The frequency of infected cell in the original sample is then estimated by Poisson statistics, and it is expressed as infected units per million. The other method um, to uh, quantify the latent reservoir is the HIV DNA assay, where a single region of um, a conserved region, usually gag or pole, is amplified by PCL and detected. Uh, finally, um, something that's in the middle of the two, which is the TILDA assay or the TET-REV induced limiting dilution assay. In this assay, cells are also activated to induce HIV uh, expression. And the evidence of um, a replication complement virus is by, uh, and it's indicated by the presence of TET and REV RNA, which are measured by a PCR method. Uh, this step, um, do away with the need for virus propagation. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of each assay? Uh, the QFOA assay um, involves high number of cells. So you can see that cell numbers required are about 100 million PBMCs. This is a lot of cells, and this means that evaluation in tissue will be very difficult to get enough um, cells to quantify um, viral outgrowth in tissue. The HIV DNA, however, requires a much lower number of cells. There's also a major difference in um, the labor intensiveness of the two assays, with the QFOA taking two to three weeks to perform, and HIV DNA can be done in a run in a day. The main advantage of the QFOA, of course, is that uh, detection of virus indicate that these are replication competent proviruses. Whereas the HIV DNA, uh, because uh, it just measures HIV DNA, there is uh, uh, what you measure are not necessarily virus that are capable of setting up productive infection. And in fact, 98% of the viruses or proviruses that you measure on the HIV DNA assay is actually defective and are not capable of um, new rounds of infection. So uh, you can see in this um, figure from um, Yachi Ho in 2003, this is what um, our, our current essays are doing. So in yellow is the QFOA essay. Because that it only uh, measures um, virus that are induced after one round of infection, you tend to underestimate the reservoir because um, there are cells that are replication competent and they're intact but they are not induced after one round of activation. So your reservoir is at the pink level. Um, the QVOA underestimates it, and the HIV DNA, because it measures defective viruses as well, overestimates it. And you can see that the difference are measured in logs. More recently um, published in Nature in 2019 is a new essay, the Intact Proviral DNA Essay, and there's a lot of interest in this essay because it is a droplet digital PCR essay. It detects intact cell-associated full-length genomic HIV DNA. So um, uh, theoretically, um, it can differentiate deletes it and hypermutated proviruses from intact proviruses because it uses two amplicon and a hypermutation discrimination probe. So this offer a lot of added advantage over the HIV DNA because of the ability to differentiate defective proviruses. So this is a very promising method to quantify the latent reservoir. As I mentioned before, there's also ongoing transcription as well as viral production going on um, whilst on ART with plasma viral suppression on antiretroviral therapy. So how do we detect those? Well, we can look at those through HIV RNA and we can look at cell-associated HIV RNA. The present does not necessarily imply productive infection. Or there is the single copy assay that measure plasma-free, uh, cell-free RNA or virions. 
And it is important to remember that the majority of individuals on ART with undetectable viral load on conventional commercial assays still have detected HIV RNA on single copy assays. So how is um, HIV persistence established? So the HIV reservoir is established very early. These are data from a study led by Dr. Jintanet and Voronich and Dr. Don Kobe, who's in the audience. And um, it involves eight participants who um, initiated antiretroviral therapy during FIBIC-1 acute HIV infection. By definition, FIBIC-1 infections mean that their nucleic test positive, but P24 and antibody negative. And it is estimated that the infection occurred in less than a week. So you can see these individuals are started on ART extremely early within a week after HIV infection. And they've been on ART for 2.8 years and before the actual treatment interruption, the single copy assay was less than 0.45 copies per mil. The HIV DNA level prior to treatment interruption was at a median of one copy, uh, sorry, one infected cell per million CD4 cells. So extremely, extremely low reservoir. However, viral rebound occurred in all eight of these participants at a median of 26 days. So this study really hammers home the fact that though viral replication is stopped extremely early, the reservoir is already seeded. And I think um, most of you will be uh, familiar with this. That is, the majority of the latent reservoir is in the memory CD4 T cell population. And this accounts for over 90% of the cellular reservoir. There has been lots of um, interest in other cell types that may propagate um, the reservoir. And a lot of interest has been in monocytes, tissue macrophages, and dendritic cells. And this is because these cells are also susceptible to HIV infection. They express C CD4 and the co-receptors. Um, and they're very long-lived. These cells have been shown to have HIV DNA in the setting of plasma virus suppression on ART. <coughs> and there's evidence that HIV transcription can occur in the setting in macrophages with the production of HIV RNA as well as viral proteins in terms of P24. However, the contribution to the latent reservoir is still unclear at this stage. So what is the effect of ART on the latent reservoir? Here you can see um, the initiation of ART at uh, time zero um, in both uh, studies. One study uses measurement of HIV DNA and the other study um, using the QFOA with latently infected cells um, per million CD4. Here you can see um, in red are total copies of HIV DNA in CD4 T cells. So it's about 7,000 um, prior to ART initiation drop rapidly um, to 1,000 uh, in a year's time and then to 500 um, at about four years and then subsequently remain very stable. So the reduction is about 90% and this is grossly different from what we see with HIV RNA where we see five, six logs of reduction within six months to a year. Similarly, um, using the q you can also see that after um, ART initiation, um, especially after the first year, the decay of the reservoir is extremely slow. So the reservoir is very, very stable. The half-life of the reservoir is estimated to be 44 months uh, in individuals on ART with plasma virus suppression. So this means that 73 years of ART is required to eradicate a reservoir of 1 million cells. So these are data um, from individuals who infect, uh, initiated antiretroviral therapy during chronic HIV infection. And of course, um, uh, in our cohort, we're particularly interested in um, acute HIV infection. So these are data um, from studies led by, again, Dr. Jintanet Anna Warrenich and Dr. Merlin Robb. Um, 
from MHLP uh, involving two different cohorts, both in Thailand, uh, and the RV217 cohort also involves sites in Africa. And here you can see the two study, the RV217 study, where participants are not initiated on antiretroviral therapy, and the RV254 study, where participants are initiated on antiretroviral therapy, usually within one or two days after the diagnosis of acute HIV infection. So what I want to point out is that prior to ART initiation, both cohorts had similar level of HIV DNA. Now, without treatment, the HIV DNA increased very rapidly, uh, and then it, it really plateaus and doesn't change much. With ART initiation, you can see that there's a rapid drop in HIV DNA that reached to very low levels, and the divergence between the treated and untreated group occur early. So even though, as I mentioned before, the early ART does not eliminate the reservoir, however, it does reduce the size of the reservoir. So now I'll home in on what, what really happens to the reservoir after um, ART initiation. So what tissues can we identify HIV persistence? Basically, um, we can find HIV in all types of tissue in the body. The most common, of course, and the majority of the reservoir resides in secondary lymph node tissues, including lymph node and lymph node tissue in the gut. But uh, it has HIV um, persistence has also been evident in the CNS, um, in the lungs, in the kidneys, in the reproductive tract, and even adipose tissue. So, as I mentioned before, the sources of HIV persistence can be latently infected cells. And this is because latently infected cells um, are long-lived. And um, so to target these cells, potentially, uh, we may use the kick and kill strategy for the kick to activate virus and kill mechanisms involving immune mechanism to get rid of the express virus. However, um, it's not as simple as that. Um, there's also clonal expansion of latently infected cell. So this is one latently infected cell but due to um, homeostatic proliferation or antigen stimulation or integration in genes that control growth and development of cells or cancer-associated genes, these cells actually proliferate. So um, you get more and more latently infected cells. And these cells, importantly, have identical, identical HIV sequences and the same integration site. And this is because they're from the same clone. So clonal expansion is actually very important. It accounts for 50% of the inducible replication competent HIV reservoir. Clonally expanded virus can be intact and infectious, and these clones have been shown to be a source of initial rebound viremia during analytic treatment interruption. Now, so how do we um, get rid of these clones? Um, Potentially, uh, anti-proliferative therapy may be useful, and there's certainly um, clinical trials at going on at the moment that looks at the effect of microphenolate in reducing proliferation and targeting um, the clones. And as I mentioned before, 80% um, of participants on ART still have persistent viremia measured by single copy assays. So what are the sources of these then? These are obviously not latent by definition because there's ongoing transcription. So what's going on? Well, the potential sources are ongoing cycles of viral replication and infection. This is quite controversial. Um, it may be due to inadequate ART potency or inadequate penetration at sanctuary sites. The other possibility is ongoing viral production from integrated proviruses, but ongoing cycles of infection are blocked by ART. So you may think, well, why is it important? Like, why, why do we need to go into all these details? What's the point of understanding this? Well, I think it's important because um, the, the ways of targeting um, these mechanisms are very different. So if the ongoing cycles of viral replication and infection is due to inadequate ART potency or penetration, then the focus should be to improve the ART. However, if the ongoing virus production is from clones of in 
to greater proviruses, these proviruses are not targeted by the existing immune responses. Furthermore, latency reversal agents will also not affect these populations because these cells are not latent, they're already actively transcribing. And whether, and the question is raised of, well, whether we can use block and lock strategy of locking these cells so that they're not transcriptionally active. And of course, um, block and lock strategies are at very early stage um, development. Um, they're only in animal models at the moment. So um, going back to ongoing cycles of viral replication and infection, if there's ongoing cycles of viral replication and infection, you will see that um, there will be mutated sequence because of the error-prone HIV reverse transcriptase, and the provirus will be integrated at a different site. Uh, so this is in contrast to clonal proliferation. Ongoing cycles of viral replication and infection is unlikely in the peripheral blood, and this is because of data that shows that emergence of new variants whilst on ART is rare, and the majority of studies shows that no reduction in the level of persistence of viremia with treatment intensification. However, this may occur in sanctuary sites, and two sites that I want to point out are the lymph node and the CNS. And this is because both sites have evidence of reduced ART penetration. In the lymph node, it's been shown that in the follicular area, there's uh, reduced immune-mediated uh, killing. Um, in both areas, uh, we can find HIV RNA expression despite suppressive art in peripheral blood. And finally, um, there's evidence of sequence evolution on art. So it may be possible that there's ongoing viral replication in sanctuary sites, but uh, we don't really see uh, much evidence of that reflected in the peripheral blood. So the second option is ongoing virus production from clones of integrated proviruses. So it's been shown that clonally expanded intact proviruses can produce sufficient virus to cause detectable low-level viremia. And in these scenarios, in these particular patients investigated, the plasma viral sequences or viral RNA measures, matches the proviral sequences, so in HIV DNA sequences, as well as matches the QFOA well sequences. So what, what does that mean? Well, that sort of translates to the fact that clonal proviruses are replication competent. They can be induced in the QFOA to produce viruses, and these viruses um, are reflected uh, in uh, mRNA, um, matching mRNA sequences in the blood. Importantly, in these studies, it also suggests that new rounds of infection are not set up on ART, and this is because um, there's no evidence of ART resistance mutation. There's also no evidence of sequence evolution in the clones, and uh, the important question is, well, how are these viruses um, being express and produce and circulate it in the blood without any um, immune uh, elimination? And how do we suppress these clones? So these questions, um, really, we do not have answers and are uh, important areas to research in. So in summary, uh, I think that it's very important to understand the mechanisms of HIV persistent in the development of strategies to induce HIV remission. And uh, I think uh, I've uh, covered in my talk that the HIV persistence on art is due to the existence of firstly the latent reservoir, but there's also the element of ongoing transcription and virus production as well. And I would like to acknowledge a number of people um, from NMHRP, Dr. Chintanet Anamornich and Dr. Sandia Fasan, who are my mentors and supervisors, uh, Dr. Eugene Kroon for his help in, um, the pres uh, in the presentation, and also um, the participants in the NMHRP studies of um, the RV254 and RV217 and the collaborators involved in those studies. Thank you very much.